investors, okay, accounted for 25% of home purchases in recent years, up from 12% in 2002. So obviously I've written articles before, private equity, but investors in general sweeping up massive quantities of single-family homes and driving up the prices of houses. So it reads, The Vultures of Suburbia, How Investors Are Devouring the American Dream. In the grand tradition of American capitalism, where opportunity is often synonymous with exploitation, we find ourselves witnessing a grotesque transformation in the housing market. The once hallowed ideal of a home ownership, the cornerstone of the middle class fantasy, is being systematically dismantled by the ravenous appetite of investors who have doubled their market share since 20, uh, 2002. Um, so let's not mince words. This is not merely a shift in market dynamics, but this is a full scale assault on the aspirations of ordinary Americans. The statistic that investors now account for 25% of home purchases is not just a number. It's a damning indictment of the system that increasingly favors those with capital over those with dreams, okay? So I just wanted to read over a few statistics. In the first quarter of 2022, investors made up a record 28% of single-family home sales, up from 19% of the first quarter of 2021. Uh, between 2017 and 2019, investors accounted for about 16% of single-family home purchases on average. Among 31 large markets analyzed by Redfin, 29 saw an increase in investor activity between 2021 and 2022. Now, of course, COVID put everything into hyperdrive with people that had capital or assets with collateral could immediately get loans. And what did they do? They socked it into one of the, the best investments known, which is real estate. Um, in Atlanta, investors made up 33.1% of home sales in the quarter uh, 2022. Uh, the highest share among m major markets. Other markets with high investor activity included Jacksonville, Charlotte, Phoenix, Miami. Okay, According to Harvard researchers, investors with large portfolios of 100-plus properties nearly doubled their share of investor purchases from 14% in September 2022, or I'm sorry, in 2020, to 26% in September 2021. So, you know, nearly double, 14% to 26%. Uh, Freddie Mac found that investor home purchases climbed 26% to 27% between December 2019 and December 2021. So all of these metrics, no matter who's, even the, the mortgage companies and the, uh, uh, these uh, financial entities are saying they're seeing an increase. And of course, the non-biased uh, journalistic entities are reporting numbers that are slightly even higher than that. But at the end of the day, it beckons the question, well, how the fuck could we let this happen? Why is this a good thing? How is this sustainable? And comparing it to something like China, which has an over 90% home ownership rate. What are we doing? That's that free market. That's the whole thing. It's like people, like one of my favorite things that people do and have done since I started paying attention to politics is that they throw out really good policy proposals um, on Twitter or on Facebook or in comment sections or whatever. And they never make the connection between why they are able to come up with such reasonable, um, obviously good ideas to fix things. And none of, nothing like that is being proposed, let alone implemented, by the smartest people who have achieved all the heights of power. You know what I mean? It's like, do we really think that the people who are in power here don't understand that it would make sense to limit in some way the amount of corporations that are able to buy houses because of the knock-on effects, let alone the just outright effects that it's having on our housing market? Right, it's like so many people in Facebook comment sections are saying, like, uh, stop making corporations people um, until Texas executes one, or whatever the fuck they say. Like, um, <laughs> or just like stop letting corporations buy the housing because it's obviously causing the homelessness crisis that we have. Or like when people just point out that there are so many empty homes, uh, even more than there are homeless people. It's like, okay, cool, we can point that out on Facebook all day. Um, when are we going to reach the next step where we? let alone asking our leaders to do something about it. We start demanding. We stop asking. We start saying, like, you are going to do something about this. And it's like, until yeah. we get to that next step, until our discourse moves beyond uh, saying, hey, let's make all the politicians wear the logos of the corporations that are sponsoring them, just like NASCAR drivers. It's like, you know how many thousands of times I've seen people suggest that online? What are you doing? You're circle jerking online. Like, let's talk about how to actually get that done instead of just, like, throwing policy proposals out into the wind.
Yeah, and we would have to we'd have to dig into that and actually figure figure that out because we are up against a lot. I mean, this is a very tall mountain to climb if you're talking about instituting these things. But I am also getting tired of the circle jerking. We can circle jerk all day. In fact, we're, we're doing a little circle jerking now, but we're, we're really trying to get to a point where it's like proactive. I don't care if – look, I'm not going to advocate for people blowing up police stations, but, you know. <laughs> I'm just saying let's move the conversation forward. Let's, let, let's say it in safe terms like that. Like, let's just move the conversation forward a little bit from where we have stagnated for decades now. And for everybody listening without uh, video, I was winking when I said that. So, uh, <laughs> These modern-day robber barons are masquerading as savvy business people. They're not content with the gleaming towers and offshore accounts. No, they must now sink their talents into the very fabric of suburban life, turning what was once a symbol of stability and achievement into just another commodity to be traded, flipped, or exploited. The apologists for this rapacious behavior will no doubt trot out their tired arguments about market efficiency and the invisible hand. But let's not be let's be clear here. There is nothing invisible about the hand that is firmly grasping the throats of the American home buyer. It's naked greed dressed up in the respectable garb of investment strategy. And what these first time home buyers, these naive souls still clinging to the quaint notion that hard work and saving might someday result in a place that they can call their own, they are left to fight over the scraps and outbid outbidded by every turn by faceless LLCs and hedge funds whose only interest in community is how quickly they can turn it into cold hard cash. Now there are, there are a bunch of uh, entities that are doing this, okay? There's Invitation Homes, the single uh, largest single-family rental company in the U.S. They own 80,000 properties. American Homes for Rent owns about 50,000. Tricon Residential uh, was recently acquired by Blackstone, has a huge amount. Uh, First Key Homes, Predium Partners, Blackstone, of course. Progress Residential, J.P. Morgan Asset Management, uh, Goldman Sachs Asset Management. They, they, there's no end to what they, they're. There's, they can't be satiated, you know. Um, so here's some statistics too. Nearly one in four renters, or 11.2 million households, spend over half their income on rent. This is true. No state in the U.S. has adequate supply of affordable housing for the lowest income renters, with 36 affordable and available rental homes for every 100 extremely low income renters and households, and. I know that just from experience. Uh, between 2000 and 2005, the median home price in Southern California increased by 117%. In San Francisco, the median house prices uh, took 620 days to receive permits in 2022. San Francisco, I live there, one of the worst places in the country to find a place to live. I knew, I knew friends that lived in a, a closet. Of somebody like they'd have to go through the whole house and then go hopefully. to the closet where they lived. Hopefully, it was a walk-in at least. I would hope so. It's not. <laughs> he's like, I sleep standing up. Thanks. <laughs> um, Literally, Futurama. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. B- Bender, bring back Futurama. I remember that. It was good. Um, oh God, I love that show. Uh, the U.S. home ownership rate fell from a pre-recession peak of 69% to a low of 63%. So on average, the, the nationwide home ownership rate is somewhere around 60%. And like I said before, China's is 90 So we could do a lot better. As of March 2023, 96 million households, or 73% of all households, were priced out of the home ownership market. Um, and finally, approximately 40 million households are in danger of becoming homeless due to a high housing cost and insufficient support. So... It's a housing crisis, folks. It's not a joke. Mm. Um, and as we watch this slow motion tragedy unfold, one cannot help but wonder, at what point will we recognize that the very foundations of our society are being auctioned off to the highest bidder? And more importantly, when will we find a collective way to say, enough is enough? The investors may have snatched up a quarter of home purchases, but in doing so, they have taken far more than bricks and mortar. They have laid claim to the future of entire communities, to the stability of families, and the very notion of what it means to be rooted in a place. This is not progress. It's a pillage. And it's high time we call it what it is. Amen. Yeah. You know, something I think about a lot, like I hate to reference Fight Club because it's such a liberal idea of revolutionary um, ideas. Like it's, it was just so rooted in toxic male insecurity left over from like the 90s and everything because i think that movie came out before 9 11 right yeah, yeah um it was like rooted in that hatred that people had for 
a middle class life that people now <laughs> really wish they could have. It was like that same kind of like American beauty, just like hatred of like the the lifestyle that Americans worked so hard to build by exploiting everyone else, and then came to hate that lifestyle. But yeah. one good thing I did like about Fight Club is that they recognized that when they blew up a bunch of empty buildings at the end of the movie, it accomplished something like financially because they were credit card buildings. But what they didn't mention is that like destruction like that is its own form of trickle down economics. And I think that like in the future, people are going to recognize that and they're going to apply it not only to like larger buildings, but targets that are easier to get to like suburban housing developments that are obviously the property of these corporate conglomerates that we're talking about. And they're going to make the connection that like, because two things that are interesting to me, it's like when people commit crimes with seemingly no motive, where it's not like they're directly profiting from it. It's like when people, like, uh, do you remember like the DC sniper, how they could not catch that person for the longest time because they weren't going after anyone that they had any motive to go after. It was like totally random. So they couldn't predict or like track this person down. It's like when people get mugged or robbed, um, they usually aren't able to find the person who did it because of the random nature of the crime. The only thing you could do is like try to find the thing that they took from you if it was like your phone or you can track it some way. But it's like when people are just attacked for no reason, when there's no profit motive, um, you never find that person. Like I've heard police tell me that like if someone just shot like a random person, especially if they did it from like far away, you would never find that murder. Like never in a million years would you find that person because there's no motive, there's no like all the, the typical signs that they look for. So when people start to connect the idea that like when they burn down or just destroy um, real estate assets of these companies, that it not only damages those companies, but then also creates a form of trickle down because those buildings are insured. They're going to get rebuilt and that's going to send money to contractors, people like you, working class people like you in your community who are then going to spend that money they're making from the insurance companies and the real estate companies in their communities, buying products that they need. That is its own form of trickle down. And when like, when there becomes that there's like some kind of even small movement of people who are just destroying real estate assets or property of big corporations, knowing that it's not going to hurt anyone in the working class, it's only going to hurt the, hurt the corporations and then result in a form of trickle down for everyone like them. That's going to be a fairly revolutionary moment, but we're not there yet. People have not made that connection, I don't think. <clears throat> I hope they do because I and the Fight Club thing, yeah, it's like the, the, the movie, the, they were going a against the white picket fence and the consumerist aspect and I, I i agree with that but yeah now we're at a point where we're desperately want that and it's like yeah best way to get trickle eco ec economics is to have an explosion and you will be you know rubble will trickle down and, and everything else will trickle down after after the fact i am i think we are in agreement that uh, a violent sort of upheaval is the only way to undo the something that's so entrenched systematically, which is like this idea that we have where, yeah, 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 oh, poor people are, are starving, homeless people, uh, things are getting worse, but this is who we are. We, we have to stick to our guns and we have to continue being these people. The brainwashing and the entrenchment is so deep that – you know, you can't just wash off something that's embedded in under your skin. You know, you actually have to have a surgery and s violently and surgically remove it. And there's going to be a lot of blood and a lot of guts. Just a quick distinction, though, I want to make is the, di the difference between violence and destruction. And this might be something that I'm just making up here. But like, just for purposes of the conversation, I would say, I think the difference between violence and destruction is violence is against people. Whereas destruction is against things like property, like physical objects. And I think that's like really notable when you have things like the BLM protests, where the conservatives are getting really upset about broken windows or destruction of property, whereas the BLM protesters are upset about the destruction of human life. And so they call the protesters violent, but they never call the police violent when they started the violence to begin with. That is what is being protested. And so I think when people, again, make that connection that like um, they could do trickle-down economics by doing destruction, of like empty buildings of assets of property and not hurt any people if they can actually do that they would not be like it would supposedly be the way to avoid getting labeled violent and extremist because you're not hurting people but of course the state would do it anyway because that's my point it's like the right and the state and the property owners they care about destruction of property they do not care about destruction of humans right yeah this is the most bizarre uh, moral paradox that that we that we have 
it makes no sense to me. And we, we need to drive it into – and I think lots and lots and lots of people are going to die before uh, uh, a bunch of people in the United States say, oh, yeah, no, 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 you're right. Human life is worth more than, than broken property. Um, look, we'll, we'll sign off here. We're going to come back maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day. We're going to do it again. So everybody stay tuned and, and, and all that stuff. Uh, anything you want to add before we go? No, just thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, all right, we'll sign off to everybody. Peace. All right.